On the eighth episode of the RGSL chat chamber, we welcome Tiako van den Hood, who is visiting lecturer at RGSL. He has been Dutch ambassador to Thailand, Myanmar, Cambodia and Laos. We touched upon topics as military coup in Myanmar, as it is one of the most recent events taking place in Asia, Southeast Asia in general, China's remarkable economic growth, Beijing consensus, and the wonderful and full of experience life that Tiako Van den Hood has had as an ambassador. Congratulations. This is the eighth episode of the chat chamber. We are very glad to host Tiako Van den Hood who is a visiting professor at RGSL. He has also been a Dutch ambassador to Thailand, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Laos, as well as a secretary general for the Permanent Court of Arbitration and the deputy secretary general of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So you have a lot of experience in your portfolio. Well, maybe, yes, I guess. But then, of course, I've reached a delicate age, so um it's a matter of uh, living through those uh, those many years that allows me to have taken those positions it is so lovely so, to have uh, you and it's, it's very nice <laughs> i hope that we're gonna have a great discussion um maybe i can start with a quote as i tend to do sometimes and um there is an Irish proverb that says that a diplomat has to think twice before it says nothing. And um, I wanted to ask you, as you have been an ambassador for quite a time, um, is this true? Have you been in a situation yourself when you truly catch yourself thinking, oh, I could say this or I could say that, but at the end of the day, you stay silent and say nothing? Hmm. Um, should I respond to this immediately or um, should I uh, pretend that I'm reflecting deeply on this rather provocative question? As you wish. As you wish. Uh, okay, uh, let me first of all uh, say something about your proverb. Uh, it's Irish, you said. I didn't know that. I like it. I like the proverb. I like it a lot more than the English proverb about the diplomat uh, that is, I think, wrongly attributed to uh, Winston Churchill. And that is that a diplomat is someone who can uh, um, speak in such a way um, uh, to someone else, um, for instance, tell him to go to hell in such a way that he looks forward to the trip. Um, I think yours um, touches more on maybe the mastery of the language as an important tool for diplomacy. And sometimes, indeed, it's better to keep your mouth shut. Now, your question directly to me is, uh, have I ever come across such uh, situations? And I would say that uh, as an ambassador, um, I have uh, had, of course, uh, on occasion, um, these moments when you meet a head of state of, or government, um, and sometimes uh, these are uh, rulers of uh, rather autocratically uh, ruled, uh, governed uh, countries, where, of course, for instance, human rights issues are uh, disrespected. Um, but at that particular level and the rare moments I have met with them, I have bit my tongue and uh, not uh, allowed myself to be tempted to, to raise such an issue. Um, but it, uh, it differs because uh, there are also, of course, moments when you have uh, instructions from capital to raise a quote-unquote delicate issue which might lead to um, some degree of anger on the part of, say, a foreign minister, and um, subsequently a robust debate, what is uh, often referred to in the media as a frank discussion. Those are the cases of frank discussion, now you know. Um, but yeah, I do recognize the issue. I also... Uh, recognize the fact that uh, in the perception of many, 
diplomats sometimes uh, sometimes are not uh, very uh, straightforward, direct in their communication, rather circumspect, uh, and maybe it's not uh, total silence that uh, then follows, but uh, some type of bland non sequitur or some um, very uh, tortured uh, formulation that uh, leaves us confused, but maybe perhaps at best at a higher level of confusion. So yeah, I, um, I recognize some of it. You touched upon a very, very topical, I think also, you know, by, by, by your experience, I think with, uh, with some autocrat autocratic leaders, you know, uh, I think we touched upon a very also topical issue, right? The recent military coup in Myanmar. Oh yeah. And uh, in, in, I think this is a th this is a very very kind of a strange uh, situation we're in because you know before planning this interview, it wasn't some uh, some of the main uh, topic we wanted to to discuss, but it just uh, in a way. You know, just dropped from heaven, as sometimes it is said. So in this situation, yeah, as a Dutch ambassador to Southeast uh, Asian region, what uh, Myanmar's political and cultural peculiarities did you observe, and and do some of them explain the recent events that have happened in Myanmar? Good, good question. A loaded one and a very broad one. So you'll need to give me some time to address it. Um, let me start by saying that uh, when I visited uh, on official uh, business, on official uh, mission, uh, visited the country, which was of course more than 10 years ago, um, I was struck, as others will have been uh, coming from uh, abroad, by the backwardness of the country. Like the country and its capital, now called Yangon, but uh, you know we know it still as Rangoon, uh, living, having existed in some type of a time warp, a time warp of some 50 years after the Second World War. After all, uh, the country was under uh, military rule, so it's been long and heavy this type of suppression of, uh, let's say, citizens' rights, not even talking about uh, human rights abuse. Uh, so, but as a result of, of that type of rule, uh, the economic growth has, of course, also been uh, uh, stunted. And uh, it's only of late that you see uh, the first features of something that might resemble a more modern economy. Uh, coming from uh, Thailand, which has a very established economy, a sophisticated one, uh, producing things like semiconductors for, for much of the rest of the world, um, it's of course uh, a, a change, a culture shock really. Um, so, Perhaps that is one of the political uh, peculiarities uh, that you were referring to, that um, we should perhaps um, introduce into the uh, equation which finally should answer your question about uh, whether these things uh, add up to uh, what has recently occurred. Another one is that uh, after uh, the country uh, uh, saw, finally saw, um, in 1948, independence uh, as part of the uh, overall decolonization effort. Um, British colonial uh, rule had left behind a society. Are you still there? A country that um, was very, very multi-ethnic. Um, and uh, of course that's very uh, complicated in terms of uh, trying to uh, achieve some feeling of unity. 
which you can imagine. There is, of course, a, a large uh, Buddhist uh, majority. The country is predominantly Buddhist, but there are um, significant uh, ethnic minorities. And I'm not talking only about the Rohingyas, who aren't even considered to be uh, citizens of the country. So here you have a group of roughly one million Muslim Rohingyas living on the, in Rakhine state on the border uh, with uh, Bangladesh, 700,000 of whom have fled the country because of prosecution. persecution. So uh, there's that type of, uh, let's say, colonial leftover, residuals from colonialism, because the, the British should have sorted this out much better than leaving it to inexperienced new uh, governments. So you have that particular element uh, as another political uh, peculiarity, uh, which uh, probably also uh, influenced the decision making. And then, of course, there is indeed this cultural, um, you mentioned also cultural peculiarity of the um, population being predominantly Buddhist, which allowed them for so long with such great patience to, uh, to cope with this extreme hardship, with uh, you know, the majority of the population living in poverty. So what was the calculus of the uh, military? If you would ask me, it was first and foremost, of course, uh, seeing uh, its influence uh, slip away and uh, with that influence, its entitlements due to the landslide victory of the, uh, the party that was in power, um, NLD, the uh, National League for Democracy, under the leadership of Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, and um, the opposition in their uh, manufactured parliament, which has a, a heavy uh, representation already of the military, uh, the opposition, which was supported by the military, uh, won maybe only 20%. So it was clear that uh, this landslide victory of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's party the uh, National uh, League for Democracy um, would, when uh, assuming the power of government, would start making changes and reducing the role of the military. Well, the military has, of course, been extremely uh, mm, uh, well uh, benefiting from the lucrative contracts uh, they had concluded with uh, Chinese uh, in terms of um, mineral uh, uh, mining uh, contracts and mineral extraction. Uh, you know, it's a, of all the countries in, in uh, Southeast Asia and probably uh, some ways beyond uh, Southeast Asia, it's the most mineral rich, resource rich country in Asia. Um, it has uh, metals, uh, precious metals, but also metals that are uh, very important for industrial manufacture. Tungsten, which is, is used for a particular type of lamps, uh, and the material used for semiconductors, and so on and so forth. And th these are uh, products that are quite rare to, uh, to obtain. And so China is taking it all in and paying, filling the pockets of the generals um, with the proceeds uh, of extraction. And um, as a result, of course, uh, that diversion of uh, th this income uh, to uh, maybe Swiss bank accounts and etc. cetera, uh, deprives the population of the uh, much needed economic reform and development that is necessary, uh, poverty alleviation and so on. So, so there's that on the one hand, uh, the prospect of finally, uh, the military finally leaving power, relinquishing power after so long, our first uh, political peculiarity, remember. 
And then the other is that they're concerned about um, uh, being uh, tied, their hands being tied by a civilian government uh, with a much stronger mandate to um, um, address the issues of, uh, let's say, activities of uh, ethnic minorities uh, in the uh, field of uh, destabilization of, uh, of the country. Uh, this, this is a concern that uh, has, uh, I think all the military have been educated on. And uh, so they're sensitive to that and they feel that this would uh, deprive them of the ability if um, they would lose power to uh, control the country. I think uh, I think what you mentioned was this uh, observed phenomenon of resource curse, right? That the countries with very useful resources sometimes fall in corruption and very very uh, limited uh, supply chains that only benefit some parts of population. And I think, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I would like to ask you. Um, from the global perspective, or maybe specifically in Asia region, uh, which of the countries um, probably in some way benefits from the actual situation uh, that this, is, this the disobedience is taking place? Yeah. Uh, so obviously, uh, China. Uh, well, let me let me say first of all that the military coup that uh, uh, unfolded on the first of February. Uh, so only a few days ago, uh, this military coup was heavily condemned by by the West, U.S., EU, and so on and so forth. Interestingly, China did not condemn it, and for obvious reasons um, that we already uh, intimated. So they will be the the real. Um, wants to benefit from a return to military dictatorship, if I may use that word, because that's, uh, of course, actually what it is, uh, because that will guarantee their unfettered access to all these resources and, uh, and a, a return to business as usual. Yeah. Um, who else should have an interest? Well, of course, the West. And the West has been trying to encourage the, uh, this very step-by-step uh, -step gradual um, process towards democratization, uh, which has now come to an abrupt halt. Um, and so, yeah, they uh, have little uh, influence uh, under the current regime and uh, no sanctions um, in heaven are going to uh, to make a difference here so that's where we are and then obviously it should be uh, to any responsible leader in uh, let's say Southeast Asia uh, member of uh, the um, the ASEAN the Association for Southeast Asian Nations. It should be, of course, of some concern, if not great concern, but this will never be uh, voiced anymore um, because China is uh, slowly, um, let's say, uh, influencing uh, the, uh, let's say, decision-making in, in certain capitals in Southeast Asia. Um, in addition to uh, to uh, Myanmar or Burma, whatever you however you wish to call it, uh, Cambodia and Laos are examples where China has a very heavy footprint. And as uh, you might be familiar, uh, under the new uh, uh, regime of President Duterte of the Philippines, uh, that country is also making overtures. Uh, or responding to Chinese overtures uh, to the detriment of uh, Western uh, interests and values. 
So you wouldn't say that this was something very surprising for the region, given the influence of China and all the projects, uh, geoeconomic and geostrategic, in the region, right? I think uh, that's correct. Uh, we have, of course, all uh, been extremely encouraged by the uh, rather uh, balanced way in which Aung San Suu Kyi was trying to uh, let's say transition from a military from military rule to uh, a civilian rule, um, but I think that the landslide victory which she won, uh, which would uh, have given her that mandate, was just a little bit uh, too much and came as a, a shock and led to fear within uh, military circles. So probably the situation won't change much in your opinion in the next uh, you know months or perhaps a year or two yeah i think that uh, within that timeline uh, that's quite uh, realistic there's no uh, expectation that uh, the uh, the chief of the military the, of the army who is now uh, taking control again uh, and who was supposed to step down uh, this uh, coming uh, summer that he will uh, follow through on his publicly made promise that uh, uh, there would now be a one-year period of uh, state of emergency, after which, uh, when matters have been cleared uh, and any uh, issue that could uh, uh, suggest uh, voter fraud has been uh, solved, uh, that there would be new general elections, um, and if there would be, I don't know uh, what we what type of credibility they would have. If you know what I mean, they will probably be manipulated. So no, I don't. Uh, I don't uh, see uh, a light at the end of the tunnel uh, in the next uh, two years or so. We'll see after that, but I'm actually uh, not too optimistic. But, uh, okay, now let's zoom a bit out of Myanmar and now look at the region of Asia, Southeast Asia more specifically. Um, in your opinion, if you have to somehow predict, how will Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia look like in the next decades? What would be your prediction of the power division and the situation overall? Yeah, it's a good question, of course. I think that... Um... You'll have a split uh, within the countries. Uh, some of the member states of ASEAN, such as Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Indonesia, will uh, be more pro-Western uh, and uh, not giving in much to the uh, ever-increasing pressure uh, of, of China. But others uh, will uh, allow that to, to continue. And um, of course, especially if we're talking about countries such as Burma or Myanmar, um, which is so resource rich, that that could pose uh, a problem in terms of, uh, you know, so the economic and geoeconomic implications for the region and for the West. So you would could we say that uh, it is an inevitable phenomenon because these South Asian states just uh, have more to benefit from cooperation with China and uh, perhaps not uh, looking so much on human rights and democracy. Well, I would, I certainly would not go that far. Uh, of course, um, under the previous US administration, the US was considered unpredictable. So there were definitely those who took comfort in the predictability of China. Predictability is an important factor huh, in, in uh, political calculus. So, uh, so there's that. Um, but as you know, uh, China also tries to uh, control uh, the uh, uh, sea routes in the South China Sea. So there's a an issue of uh, freedom of navigation, perhaps, uh, lying ahead of us, uh, which could lead to some type of uh, 
confrontation uh, with either the US Sixth Fleet and uh, the Chinese uh, PLA Navy or um, Australia, New Zealand, the others, um, Japan, South Korea, the other um, Western allies that are teaming up to, uh, to patrol that uh, region. Because the sea routes uh, through the uh, South China Sea are, of course, the lifelines, not only for China, but also for Japan, for, for the, you know, the, the uh, highly sophisticated economies of Japan and uh, South Korea. I just would you I, say that sorry please Martha. i just i just was very very uh tempted to ask about the predictability um to what extent predictability is good because you know if we look at trump it was very interesting to look at him you know you never know what is going to come next of course people try to make any, some predictions what would be his next you know action against china and uh, their relationship development and stuff like that but what is the where is the line of pred predictability to be good and to be boring <laughs> um I don't think that uh, international relations in any way is boring and uh, some some degree of predictability in terms of commitments made uh, to partners is vital uh, for the security of uh, those involved. So if you look at um, for instance, also uh, within the uh, NATO alliance, uh, Trump's uh, decision uh, earlier to withdraw uh, uh, troops from Germany, as you might remember, has just uh, yesterday, I think, been rescinded by the Biden administration. So that's not going ahead. Uh, so there's, uh, I think, a little bit more feeling of comfort on the part of the European um, member states of NATO. And you have similar situations, feelings going on in Asia uh, with regard to those that rely on, uh, let's say, uh, US protection. But Rick, if we look also in the concept of predictability, I think there is one thing that also can be predicted in the, uh, let's say, yeah, South Asian region, right? The overpassing of Indian population uh, comparing to China. And yeah. uh, what perhaps would be your opinion? What is the biggest challenges uh, which uh, would uh, India face and perhaps also the region and, and, and the, the global community as such and also some weaknesses that uh, uh, might Indian uh, population, Indian government and the glo global community face. Mm. Well you're talking about a part of uh, the world that um, is responsible for a the lion's share of the world population with uh, China being uh, somewhere around 1.3 billion and, and India uh, creeping up very uh, gradually toward and, and sort of expected to surpass that uh, Chinese number um, rather soon. Uh, what would that mean? Well, it would mean, of course, um, given the fact that it functions as a democracy with individual states within the uh, country uh, having some uh, administrative independence, uh, the challenges are huge, huge. Um, in that respect, I think uh, China is um, uh, structured in a way that uh, can, uh, that has a more streamlined decision making uh, uh, system, uh, whatever else you might think of it. Uh, but we're not passing judgment on that. That's not the question. But of course, for the largest democracy in the world, India, to experience further population growth, if it does not also uh, introduce uh, further economic reforms and socio-cultural reforms, 
uh, will uh, find itself in a in a very difficult position within the next 10 years already. Um, because you're going to have issues of hunger, scarce resources, even water. Potable uh, drinking water is going to be an issue. Um, and then food. Uh, how do you produce food for uh, this increased population uh, and get it uh, to the uh, the large cities um, uh, and uh, and have the people uh, living in the countryside uh, properly uh, taken care of. And I'm not even talking about uh, complicated uh, services such as healthcare. But uh, but all this uh, will burden any government in charge of uh, um, facing these challenges and uh, it will perhaps also uh, inhibit uh, the possibility of the population if these reforms are not um, uh, carried out to um, to flourish and uh, uh, be given, allowed to uh, enjoy their full potential. Because there is a lot of talent. There is a lot of talent in, in India, you know, especially also in the IT uh, area. Uh, but of course, it needs more because that is a limited uh, sector in terms of employment. Uh, it needs a lot more to uh, uh, for the country and uh, its economy to sustain itself. So yes, uh, big challenges ahead for India. And I think uh, uh, there is too little attention uh, given to this particular problem. Since it's also, of course, uh, a friend of the West, given that it's uh, a democracy, um, I think we should pay much more attention to the uh, uh, let's say the problems of uh, of India. I think this is a very interesting, uh, not interesting. I would say more a condemn. A con uh, we can a, con a, a condemnable yes uh, example from from the last century of China how they try to tackle these pop problems of overpopulation and starvation. And would you say that there is a possibility that there will be a decline of democracy in India? Well, um, I can't say that uh, at the moment we are experiencing uh, uh, democracy at the highest uh, uh, moral uh, or ethical level in India. Uh, you know that there are uh, uh, serious issues already uh, and under the current leadership of Modi, um, there is an uh, inclination to uh, go uh, Hindu national uh, uh, to the detriment of, uh, of other groups. Uh, and I think that clouds uh, judgment for what is uh, best for overall for the country and for its economy, and might even uh, lead to uh, uh, foreign investors uh, losing uh, interests that they uh, had earlier. Um, next question is going to be more concentrated on China and more specifically about China, uh, Beijing consensus and Washington consensus. And uh, my question is, um, as we know that China is remarkable in its economic growth and it is often been attributed uh, to strong government intervention that can mobilize large amounts of resources. And in that way, they clear any bottleneck to, to growth or institutional change. And this, uh, this is the approach that has been often uh, refer referred to as the Beijing consensus. And, um, and I want to ask you um, whether this can be even compared to Washington consensus as, you know, it is the former being 
of authoritarianism model, a heavy state involvement in the economy. And um, are there any existing similarities between these two? And if yes, then to what extent? Yeah, the, uh, the term Beijing consensus is, of course, a little bit uh, less known than the Washington consensus. Um, and we now uh, define the two along the lines of, I think, what you were um, alluding to uh, with the Washington consensus uh, focused more on a liberal economic uh, approach uh, as contrasted with the Chinese model, which is then uh, the, uh, the uh, heavily centralized uh, economic planning uh, model of, of China. But you're totally right, and it's something I alluded to already, I, I intimated earlier. Um, China, of course, uh, has been able, because of the way its, its government is structured, to, uh, to uh, resolve obstacles uh, much more uh, smoothly and quickly than uh, would have been the case if it had had some type of a complicated democracy. Now, having said that, we all, of course, also know that uh, there are huge uh, disadvantages of this system as well. Uh, there is no criticism or uh, perceived criticism uh, accepted. Uh, anything that might uh, bring uh, into focus in a critical way the Chinese Communist Party. So when the the first uh, patients uh, were discovered with uh, an infection of COVID, uh, it was hushed. It was hushed up. Now that, of course, would not have happened in a democracy. As certainly not a a democracy uh, in, in the West uh, that immediately reaches the media and so on and so forth, and then governments take action. This was hushed up, and uh, as a result, the Chinese, uh, of course, took action uh, much later than they could have. So, yeah, uh, the uh, what you are referring to as the Beijing consensus has certain pros, but it also has definite uh, cons. I think this couldn't have uh, been a smoother transition to the question of uh, if you take a look at the world right now during the COVID pandemic, right? And you have to evaluate personally uh, from your experience and, and what you have read, the existing situation from, yeah, from the perspective of state cooperation and uh, their communication through the pandemic situation or preparation of the vaccine, for example. Is there something you feel could have been done differently, better maybe so that we managed to prevent a lot of problems from happening? Uh, so perhaps a diplomatic perspective, some... Uh, so what do you think about this? Well, um, I think uh, many people are asking this question, uh, many people in high places. Uh, because we have not done well. We have certainly not done well. Uh, so there are many lessons to be learned here, uh, starting with uh, uh, forward planning and uh, preparation for any type of pandemic. Uh, there was a task force in the United States dealing with these issues that was disbanded, disbanded uh, under Trump. Can you imagine? Um, so there is um, it's necessary to redevelop some type of a, a cycle uh, that will allow for uh, governments not only in the us but also in europe and elsewhere to uh, to uh, think through what it takes to uh, to deal with uh, a, a pandemic like this one and then um, that includes also uh, the type of measures to uh, contain it uh, and uh, going down to the logistical aspects of supply chains 
Very important, huh? Because we've been very nationalistic, uh, which is not good. Uh, there's been a lack of coordination uh, amongst states, even within the EU. Can you believe it? So much for European integration. Uh, so this is, of course, within the uh, criteria of the EU, not a field, the health uh, sector is not a field where we are integrated, but maybe we should rethink that. So that's something for the EU to uh, ponder about. But uh, overall, I think there's been, uh, with the exception of one or two, I think uh, South Korea stood out as, and Taiwan was, uh, have stood out as uh, good shining examples of how it can be dealt with. But uh, overall, uh, no, I think that uh, many are going back to uh, their uh, work tables and uh, going to uh, look at ways in which this um, will never be repeated. Yeah, so there's forward thinking, there's preparation, there's issues of uh, logistical chains and, um, and of course, also just the massiveness of uh, inoculation of, of uh, your population, some uh, scattered in remote places, difficult to access. I mean, there are huge uh, issues that need to be thought through properly uh, for the future. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that uh, it will still take years uh, to assess what is the best approach for the future but we'll get we'll get it right we'll get it right i want to ask you but you know you said about the future i want to look at the past um but how about your past um oh. how, how about um why embassy why diplomacy how did you end up being there Mm. Did you did you have a you know a dream when you were a small child in the childhood thinking ah I want to I want to be a diplomat or it was just going with the flow and seeing where the flow goes. Um, I think I uh, I think I uh, always wanted to, to uh, travel. And I am very interested in different cultures, um, um, visiting also, um, let's say, far away places. I've uh, undertaken an expedition to uh, uh, the Stone Age tribes uh, of the Papuas in New Guinea when I was stationed in Jakarta, but just flying in a twin otter two engine small plane with uh, maybe eight other passengers for uh, you know something like 1500 if not 2000 kilometers from Jakarta to this place uh, uh, in itself was of course already exciting but then landing in the eastern highlands of New Guinea and then walking from one village to the other, because there wasn't any form of transportation. We didn't have cars or jeeps or anything like that. We walked and there were uh, people who carried, you know, that were hired obviously, that carried our, uh, our, our food and supplies and so on and so forth. Uh, and we slept in the villages and, and the huts, uh, which of course were full of smoke because it gets cold there in the evening. Eastern Highlands, remember. So uh, we're talking about uh, uh, fantastic experiences, and uh, and then visiting Malaysia, other parts of uh, Indonesia. Uh, I've spent many years, also, of course, in the U.S. Um, but um, I've served in uh, in Africa twice. These were little uh, jewels. Um, that I'm very grateful of, uh, and, and um, yeah, diplomatic service offered that. Now it could have been something else. It could have been working for. I toyed with the idea of an, uh, working for uh, an international company, multinational. I mean, 
It depends, but uh, I always had uh, an interest in uh, international relations, so uh, I think the choice was not that hard, not that hard. Um, but it wasn't like I, uh, at the age of seven I wanted to be a diplomat, no, no. But maybe when you uh, grow up in a relatively small country like the Netherlands, and we're half the size of Latvia, don't forget, <laughs> uh, you have this urge to go out to, uh, well, as the, the Dutch have, have done as a, in the days of uh, explorations. Yeah, so... so emotional. Uh, I was, I, I'm so inspired right now. Um, but I know the urge. I truly know. I want to go out and, you know, explore the world, world and stuff. So, um, as a, I wanted to, I just wanted to say, what uh, is this kind of a urge? What was the main like? I can, I, I can't even describe this question. Like, how can you describe this uh, want to be outside and to explore? And, and perhaps, what, what is the, what is the something that you gain from 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 being in, abroad? And then, how can you, how can you? Yeah, how could you describe that? You know, it's um, close to a question that uh, sometimes my uh, my family poses uh, to me. What would you like as a birthday present? Uh, a thing or an experience? And it's always, I say, experience, of course. And uh, because, yeah, thing, I mean, we have enough things. So um, I think it is uh, the, it's, it's not the end result of having served somewhere. It's the journey towards that destination. So it's those years that you spend there, day after day, meeting different people. That is so enriching. It's so enriching, and I think it uh, also makes you a more interesting person uh, to talk to. Um, and of course, I, I've lost some friends from the time of my studies at Leiden University, and uh, even some schoolmates from high school, because they remained stuck in their life uh, at home, have never uh, lived abroad, so uh, eventually, of course, you you have a communication you have a communication problem. No, I'm, I'm, they they of course um, are commendable in in their decisions, but it's just not me, and and so yeah, they don't really get excited about what I tell them, and I certainly didn't get excited about what uh, they were telling me uh, during those exchanges. I don't know. Does that help? Oh, indeed. Oh, I got, I got so excited. I want to have a cup of tea or coffee with you and chat about those times. You're happy to. Uh, you're welcome. I, I'd enjoy that as well with both of you, by the way. Um, but uh, no, please. Uh, any other question on this? So, so this was this was a diplomatic service, of course. Uh, being a deputy secretary general of the foreign ministry is an experience onto itself because that's uh, you're responsible for more than uh, 1500 2000 uh, staff uh, split up of course in uh, various directorates and so on an interesting experience but i was actually glad to uh, then make that transition to an international organization which was much smaller uh, and that um, brought me to uh, uh, my, my government uh, suggested uh, me as a candidate for the uh, Secretary General post of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And uh, I was voted in and uh, served for, what was it, four or five years, and then was re-elected uh, for another term. So I served, and I stepped out one year before my second term ended, so after nine years, but those were wonderful nine years. I had uh, total freedom, unlike, of course, one does uh, in a bureaucracy with everything uh, so well regulated 
here uh, it was much more um, not relaxed but uh, you know uh, let's say more um, uh, quicker agile is the word that I was looking for uh, it could quickly respond to any needs uh, that uh, arose and so on and and during my uh, my two terms there I've met with I don't know how many foreign ministers uh, including those in the South Caucasus I've spoken to the foreign minister of Georgia Azerbaijan and so on and so forth. I've been to Central America, spoken to the foreign ministers of uh, Honduras, Guatemala, uh, and, you know, they all have disputes, you know. <laughs> and uh, so my my role, of course, was uh, espousing, advocating the uh, the benefits of arbitration uh, in settling and peacefully in international dispute. So what would be your, um, how did your perception change uh, after those nine years, right? So you've seen a lot of disputes, you've seen a lot of uh, nationalities, mentalities, right? And then, so what, what would you say did you see in those nine years? Maybe um, I saw it best after I returned to the diplomatic service and the government uh, offered me the position of uh, ambassador to these four Southeast Asian countries, because there, with that uh, new knowledge I had acquired, newly acquired knowledge of dispute resolution mechanisms, of course, I was a very um, respected uh, um, counterpart for any foreign minister or any privy council. I've given a presentation for the King's Privy Council, uh, elderly gentlemen uh, that uh, were interested in how they deal with a particular uh, dispute with Cambodia. And uh, you know, it, it's cool, that's, re that's really nice. And of course, at the same time, I was giving uh, these, these lectures, public lectures um, on, uh, on the PCA or on particular disputes. So I've done a lot of that also uh, as an ambassador. I've, uh, on the issue of human rights, so I'm moving away a little bit from PCA again, um, because, um, yeah, I'm reminded again of your English, uh, your uh, Irish proverb um, about uh, diplomats. Um, I, um, it, it, when I was serving as ambassador in uh, Bangkok, I noticed in reading the Bangkok Times that uh, there was this uh, uh, attempt by uh, a certain group to justify uh, the recent Thai Les Majesté legislation laws which protect the, I don't know if you've heard of this term, les majesté, it means basically insult uh, the, uh, the king or uh, the majesty. Uh, so it was uh, legislation to quote unquote protect uh, the good name and reputation of the monarch, okay? Now, you can imagine, of course, uh, at the time, um, the government uh, in Thailand had also been uh, uh, seeing a change and the military were in power. And this was heavy uh, legislation to basically have a tool to arrest anyone who could be accused, even, uh, you know, with uh, a shred of evidence, not a shred of evidence, without a shred of evidence. Uh, to be accused of insulting the king by an email, by a blog, and so on and so forth. So, um, so there was this stuff going on, and um, so I, when I read this article that I mentioned to you in the Bangkok Times, uh, that uh, was being defended by a particular professor from uh, a university in Bangkok. 
um, this um, this uh, professor said that and anyway uh, European monarchies also have this so I, I wrote uh, an article uh, in response to it uh, saying that uh, I commended uh, the author for writing this and that uh, uh, expansive um, discourse but I had to sorry disagree with um, his claims that it was similar in, in, in European monarchs because we are much, much more relaxed and we often see any type of prosecution because of uh, a, um, a uh, possible uh, insult, probably more disadvantageous for the monarchy than, uh, than it uh, being helpful to protect it. So, and this article has been quoted and re-quoted and it went viral, really. I can send it to you both. Um, it's still it's still out there and uh, it's interesting to read. And uh, it starts with um, the, uh, you with your proverbs, uh, Marta, um, that um, the freedom of expression is the, uh, uh, is the oxygen uh, of democracy and uh, you know that type of terms um, and uh, yeah it uh, I think uh, put me uh, in in a very special category of ambassadors that spoke his or her mind so I didn't mind going public there and of course, uh, our own queen, I think, who wanted, when I uh, finally retired, wanted to speak to me about it, but uh, I was in, in Riga and I thought, I'm not gonna <laughs> go into Reject this conversation. Well, <laughs> I didn't have to. I mean, it was uh, more that I knew that she uh, had been intrigued by uh, by the fact. She heard it, of course, from members of the uh, the Thai royal house because you know monarchs uh, see each other anyway this this is just to say that um, it's it's not always uh, tight-lipped and uh, not speaking your mind and sometimes you're just inspired by uh, circumstances so there you are i think we got inspired by you you know, um, I think this was a wonderful conversation. I I truly benefited so much, and I think Chris first did as well. And I hope that you enjoyed. And, then, and oh, I did. But I, of course, I find you two, of course, uh, quite special already uh, as as former students of mine. And I uh, felt uh, privileged to have you both in different classes but uh yeah but still together here you know afterwards after yeah. the classes yeah good good and i We're think really we could have you know a longer conversation you know going on and on but the time is limited and we yeah. want to thank you for joining us on the eighth episode of the rgsl chat chamber and we had a great chat i think um yeah. about many things and um indeed i would say i would say that I think that listeners will probably uh, benefit from your expertise on South Asia, Asian region, your thoughts on uh, India as well as China, the future of, of uh, the, re the region of South Asia, uh, as well as uh, your thoughts on COVID pandemic and you, of course, uh, last but not least, as a person, which is, I think, the most valuable insight here. So thank, definitely, thank you. Definitely. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.